Back to the Laura Coast Show. Hey, welcome back to the Laura Coach Show here on Sirius XM POTUS, 866-967-6887. Hey, we're learning more about what um, might be ahead in terms of the investigation into the shooting death of Helena Hutchinson on the set of Rust. She is a uh, mother, wife, deeply admired colleague, and she was just the age of 43 years old when she was shot on the set as a cinematographer by a so-called prop gun. The director was also shot, he's 48 years old, in the same apparently live round that killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins, excuse me, just, just 42, she's just 42 years old, excuse me, on the New Mexico set just six days ago. Well, the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office held a press conference today and was speaking about these issues and providing additional information about what it is the state of the investigation is right now. And the and here's what they had to say about this very issue. The man who pulled the trigger and as a producer on the movie, does Alec Baldwin himself face the potential of criminal charges? And if the DA could perhaps follow up with that as well. That may be a, a, a question better answered by the district attorney. Um, all options are on the table at this point. I'm not take, I'm not commenting on charges, whether they will be filed or not, or on whom. So. The answer is we we cannot answer that question yet until we complete a more thorough but investigation. No one has been ruled out at this point. Is Alec Baldwin, is Alec Baldwin, is Alec Baldwin, is, sorry, is Alec Baldwin considered a person of interest right now? No, that's you. <laughs> he's he's obviously the person that fired the weapon. So we're going to continue interviewing and getting to uh, getting the facts of his statements and the evidence and the case and possible witnesses or anybody that has any information. So right now, he is an active part of this investigation. Sheriff um, Adam, Don Mendoza also said there was, was some complacency on the set. Uh, I think the industry has, has a, had a record recently of being safe. I think there was some complacency on this set. And uh, I think there are some safety issues that need to be addressed by the industry and possibly by the state of New Mexico. But I'll leave that up to uh, to the industry and the state to determine what those need to be. Let's talk to Richard C. Bell, a civil and liability attorney, to talk about the potential criminal or civil liability and the precedents that have been set in the industry already in terms of how to evaluate these cases and cases like this. Of course, um, welcome back to the show, Richard C. Bell. How are you? I'm well, thank you for having me back, Laura, and I, I really want to commend you because, you know, the focus has been on Alec Baldwin, obviously he's a celebrity, this is a tragic incident, but you got to the essence of what the focus should be, and the focus should be that a 43-year-old mother whose child will never see her again because of someone's negligence is no longer here, and I think we, we lose that, unfortunately, we've lost a bit of our humanity, and you didn't, and I commend you for that. Oh, well, well, thank you for saying that. And I know that um, I can I can extend the compliment right back to you because this has been top of mind for you, that very issue of, of negligence. And I know people think, look, lawyers are always just trying to sue someone. But in reality, the reason you have not only criminal cases, but civil cases can be about deterrence and can be about taking corrective action to ensure that that which has happened never happens again. And this is a real concern in terms of how you would think about, you use the term negligence. And what what sticks out to you immediately about when you heard about this case, Richard, um, what was your immediate reaction? I know the word negligence probably came to mind, notice or duty of care soon to follow. Yeah, sure. So since this is what I do for a living, the first thing that pops in my head is so negligence is when someone acts below the standard of care of a reasonably prudent person under the circumstances. In lay language, what it means is who was supposed to check to make sure, number one, there's no live ammunition in there. Who's supposed to check that every protocol and checklist is, 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 is scrupulously uh, adhered to? And who is supposed to make sure that you don't hand an actor a, a gun and, and, and say that it's a cold gun that has no ammunition in it? I mean, this so sounds like pretty outrageous conduct to me. 
you know, let's liken this to the idea of, and I, I think it's often helpful for people to think about cases when you, if you take away the celebrity aspect, if you take away um, the the specific facts of this case as we know it, and think about the concepts in it, where in areas people are more accustomed to hearing about. And I think about medical negligence as an example. You think of the idea of the passing of a prop gun can be analogized to the passing of some medical instrument or otherwise, right? And the idea, or a, or a supply chain, the idea of by the time you get the car, somebody has looked at the starter, you know, the, the engine in some respect. They've looked at a starter plug. They've looked at different aspects. So there's a chain of operations that go on that by the time it gets to you, you're supposed to feel safe. And I think that is, when you think about it from that perspective, you know, the duty of care and the standards of what is normal behavior of a reasonable person in that situation really makes more sense to people. And so if you, how does one establish who this reasonably prudent person is? It's a phrase that we often hear, but how does one establish who that is? Okay. Reasonably prudent person is whoever the jury thinks is a reasonably prudent person. A jury, <laughs> yes. if it ever goes to that, will decide what was reasonable. I'll give you a great example. You just talked about medical negligence, so I do medical malpractice. I had a case. A woman was, uh, was in labor. She's giving birth. Everything seems to go well. There's uh, a kind of a changing of the guard because their obstetrician comes in uh, late. So he's on call. Another obstetrician starts. Everything ends. Everything seems well. Within a week, she's having horrible pains. They say, don't worry about it. They finally go to the emergency room. They left seven gauze pads in this woman. So what you wow. were talking about protocols, you have to do a count. That's one of the most basic things, nurses and doctors, you have to do a count. Everything that was in this room, make sure it's still here because otherwise it's probably in the patient. So that's uh, a jury would decide that's not reasonable. So a reasonable doctor wouldn't do something like that. So the me- the film standards, the industry standards become all the more important. You're talking about the use of, say, prop guns. And this has been a concept that people have been, frankly, fighting against for a while because of the introduction of, you know, um, computer generated technology that allows for you to mimic the sound, say, of a real bullet or the look of the flare, the idea of trying to use technology to um, replace what ha- what is obviously very very dangerous and if there is a t- a trend towards the use of computer you know CGI in some respects does that mean that the standard of care has also changed or can you have sort of competing standards based on the choice of what technology to use well you can have competing standards and one of the ways that would come out uh in, the, in a lawsuit here by the the estate of uh, of Miss Hutchins would be you would have experts in the in the field of uh, handling of firearms on sets and the the standard might be it's okay to have them when they're unloaded or to have certain types of blanks in them and other times technology and have certain protocols so what the standards are would basically in a case like this be testified to at, uh, by the experts. But I think one of the things we have to say is this isn't new. It was that tragic case of Brandon Lee, Bruce Lee's son. That was yes. back in 1993. He was 28 years old. He's on the set. And in the scene before his scene, there were these hollowed out cartridges. They call them dummy cartridges. And they were supposed to be removed after that earlier scene was done and replaced with blanks. Well, what happened there was that the tip of one of those dummy bullets, it broke off in the cartridge, but nobody checked the gun before it was used in the next scene. So they didn't know there was still a tip broken off in the gun. And when the gun was shot, it was supposed to be a blank coming out. Well, that cartridge, that dummy bullet, the tip that was still in there, it got dislodged at the speed of a bullet and killed him. So that's a, a horrible tragedy, but it's not new to Hollywood. As a matter of fact, the Associated Press did an uh, investigation from uh, 1990 to 2016, and they found over 43 people had died on movie set accidents and 150 had sustained life-threatening injuries. Now, in any other workplace, would that be acceptable? 
No, I mean, just I mean, that's that's a shocking statistic you just given us. And it also tells me that, you know, if if you're on.